a quorum of the committee present and say hello to everyone. As we begin, I want to note we're holding this hearing in compliance with the regulations for remote committee proceedings pursuant to House Resolution 8. We ask committee members and witnesses to keep their microphones muted when they're not speaking uh, and to unmute themselves when seeking recognition. Uh, witnesses will also need to unmute themselves uh, when recognized for their five minutes or when answering a question. We ask that everyone keep their uh, cameras on at all times, even if you need to step away for a moment. That's what the rules require. And of course, we remind members that the rules also uh, require that we cannot participate in more than one committee proceeding at the same time. At this time, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days and revise and extend their remarks and have any written state statements be made part of the record and hearing no objections, that is so ordered. Uh, I also ask unanimous consent that here be authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time and hearing no objections, that is also ordered. Um, I want to welcome today's Smithsonian Institution uh, oversight hearing and we'll focus on the threat that climate change poses to the Smithsonian's facilities and the national treasures and historical artifacts they house. It seems that not a day goes by when we aren't reminded of the immense financial cost of climate change, floods, droughts, heat waves, extreme storms, wildfires, each made more frequent and devastating by climate uh, change. And they're just some of the effects of my climate change that we're now experiencing firsthand. According to a recent uh, report by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Weather and climate disasters in 2020 alone cost over $100 billion. Now, experts agree that these costs will only increase over time, which is uh, to say nothing of the human cost of climate change. In Washington, and in particular on the National Mall, the effects of climate change uh, most significantly would be in the form of sea level rise and flooding. According to the National Park Service, the sea level in Washington is projected to increase by two to six feet by the end of the century, bringing with it more extreme storms and powerful storm surges. The changing climate poses a danger to the Smithsonian's facilities and the irreplaceable uh, treasures contained therein. A recent New York Times piece detailed how increasingly heavy rainstorms have greatly increased the risk of flooding on the National Mall, the site of 11 Smithsonian museums and how rising sea levels will eventually push water from the Potomac River and submerge sections of the National Mall. Let me put that thread in context. Last week, many Americans visited the World War II Memorial, both to commemorate the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor and to pay our respects to the late Senator Bob Dole. Senator Dole was, as we all know, a decorated war veteran um, who was gravely wounded in combat and later played a key role in establishing the memorial. For those who have visited the memorial, you may recall seeing just steps away, a curved stone wall built into the National Mall, which extends into the slope below the Washington Monument near an old stone house. That wall is not simply an interesting architectural feature, it's a levee built to protect an area of the National Mall that for much of human history was underwater. When the city of Washington was settled, Tiber Creek the second largest creek in the district, met the Potomac River there near a today's World War II memorial. In fact, as a map provided to President George Washington in 1793 shows, at that time to get from the White House to where the iconic monument named for President Washington stands today, you would not have needed a boat. Today, the water that used to run on the surface of Tiber Creek flows through underground sewers that run through much of the city from near the Capitol and down the length of the mall. Today, today, the land has been filled in and Constitution Avenue is lined by buildings, including the museums of the Smithsonian. But the threat posed by the natural top, uh, topography remains. <clears throat> the New York Times article described in detail how water has already started to intrude upon the National Museum of American History, seeping in through the basement floor, ceilings, gaps between ground level windows and the building's ductwork. The mu museum staff has struggled valiantly, but sometimes with little success 
to keep the water out and away from the museum's exhibits and artifacts. The intruding water does not just threaten these cherished items directly, but indirectly via the risk it poses to the building's electrical and ventilation systems, which keep the building's humidity at an appropriate level for the preservation of these artifacts. It's not an exaggeration to say that the threat climate change poses to the Smithsonian's facilities and collection is also a threat to our preserved history and future generations' access to it. Every piece held by the Smithsonian tells a story about the people and things that came before us. It, in what is affectionately known as our nation's attic, we find the figurative thread that weaves together the narrative of our wonderful country. Much of the discourse surrounding climate change rightfully focuses on how it will impact our future. However, however, today we focus on the possibility that climate change also threatens our past. We must do everything we can to reduce emissions and slow the rise of global temperature for the future of humanity. At the same time, our institutions must adapt to the changes in the climate already set in motion. And to that end, I am eager to hear about the Smithsonian's efforts to date to protect its irreplaceable treasures and stunning facilities and to find out how Congress can help ensure that its collections remain safe, regardless of the climate change uh, challenge. And with that, I would like to recognize our ranking member, Rodney Davis, for any comments that he would like to make. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for joining us today at our first hearing on the Smithsonian Institution this conference, uh, which is tailored to the very specific issue of climate change and how it affects the Smithsonian Institution and the National Mall. The last time this committee held a hearing on the Smithsonian Institution was February 5th of 2020, nearly two years ago. The topic of that hearing was the potential creation of new museums. Prior to that, the Smithsonian came before us in September of 2019 for a discussion on the overall strategic plan and management of the institution, which I also believe was the last time that Ms. Helm joined us. So thanks for being here again, Ms. Helm. A lot has happened since then. Museums have closed and reopened in response to a global pandemic. Two additional museums have been approved by acts of Congress and longstanding institutional issues have continued, uh, many of which have contributed to an over $1 billion deferred maintenance backlog. Ms. Helm is quite familiar with these issues, having included them in her testimony before this committee three years ago. Longstanding management challenges related to collections management, facilities management, information security, and physical security. Unfortunately, that list is expanded to include mission creep of an increasingly one-sided progressive educational agenda, as well as the shocking and saddening reports of sexual abuse and possible sexual assault at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. There are many issues that this committee needs to discuss with the Smithsonian, so I'm disappointed that today's discussion has been designed to ignore more pressing issues. The Smithsonian's collections are priceless, but the long-term health of the Smithsonian, its strategic plan, and the care of its employees as much as its collections should be part of this discussion. But the outgoing majority is the one that controls the hearing schedule and topics for this conference. Since we're here to talk about climate change and its impact on the Smithsonian, I do hope that as part of today's hearing, we can get a better understanding and clarity of how the Smithsonian can reconcile its position of needing more resources to mitigate the, quote, imminent threat of flooding on the National Mall, while at the same time actively engage in efforts to build additional museums on or around the mall. Common sense would tell you that those two things seem to be in conflict. In closing, I hope that we have the Smithsonian come before this committee again soon so that we can conduct proper oversight of the institution rather than focus on just one report or respond to one New York Times profile. With that, look forward to hearing from our witnesses and I yield back, Madam Chair. Uh, the ranking member yields back. Other members are invited to submit their statements for the record and I would now I have the pleasure of welcoming our witnesses. Joining us this afternoon are Nancy Bechtol, Director of Smithsonian Facilities, Kathy Helm, the Inspector General for the Smithsonian, and Fetmano Fanabong, the Senior Project Manager at Atkins North America. Nancy Bechtel has served as the Director of Smithsonian Facilities 
since 2012. In this role, she manages all facilities, planning, design, construction, engineering operations, and maintenance needs across all Smithsonian facilities. To give you a sense of the size of that responsibility, <clears throat> the Smithsonian's worldwide portfolio is over 12, 12 million square feet with over 600 buildings and 43,000 acres of land. All of this is maintained using an in-house workforce of over 1,000 full-time employees and, op and an operating budget of over $400 million. Ms. Bechtel also oversees the Office of Safety, Health, and Environmental Management, Smithsonian Gardens, and the Office of Emergency Management. She serves as, as a Smithsonian Senior Sustainability and Climate Change Adaptation Officer. She graduated from the University of Maryland with a Bachelor of Science degree in Horticulture, and she reads, uh, received her Master's of Science from the University of Delaware. She is a Certified Facility Manager uh, through the International Facility Management Association. Kathy Helm has served as the Inspector General of the Smithsonian since 2014. Her office conducts audits and investigations relating to Smithsonian programs and operations. Uh, she keeps the Board of Regents and Congress informed about problems and deficiencies found. She promotes efficiency and effectiveness within the Smithsonian, uh, prevents uh, and detects case cases of fraud, waste, and abuse, and makes recommendations regarding existing policies and regulations at the Smithsonian. Prior to this role, Inspector General Helm was Deputy Inspector General at the GAO and Assistant uh, Director for the Office of Inspector General. Um, she was the Assistant Director for the Human Capital Office and the Assistant Director for the Natural Resources and Environment Team. She graduated from George Washington University with a Master's in Public Administration in 1980, and she earned her Bachelor's Degree in 1978 at Western Kentucky uh, University. Uh, finally, but not least, Fetmano Fanavong currently works as a Senior Projects Manager at Atkins North America and has 20 years experience in water resources, engineering, uh, project and program man management, and national flood resilience uh, policies. In his current uh, role, he provides technical support as a subject matter expert in federal, state, and local governments <clears throat> on future conditions in climate science approach and flood hazard mapping, building code strategies, and resilience policy and flood risk management. Prior to joining Atkins North America, he was a former District of Columbia National Flood Insurance Program Coordinator and Floods Plain Manager. He also co-founded the DC Silver Jackets, an interagency flood management team. He is a registered professional engineer in both DC and Virginia, a certified project management professional by the Project Management Institute, and a certified floodplain manager by the Association of State Floodplain Managers. Inspector General Helm testified uh, before our committee during a 2019 uh, Smithsonian oversight hearing, as our ranking member has mentioned. So it is a pleasure uh, to welcome her back. And um, Ms. Helm and Mr. Fanavong, I'm thrilled, thrilled to welcome you both. And uh, before uh, turning to you, I would note once again that uh, members have, uh, uh, by unanimous consent, five legislative days to revise and extend the remarks. And I'll remind witnesses that your entire written statement will be made part of the record. We ask that your uh, verbal testimony be about five minutes. We have a clock uh, that's on this virtual uh, space that will help you keep track of the time. When your five minutes are up, we ask that you uh, try and summarize so the next witness can be heard. We'll turn to you, uh, Ms. Bechtel, first for your testimony and welcome. Thank you so much for the invitation to be a witness today. Chairperson Lofgren, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the threat climate change poses to the Smithsonian. Climate change has long been important to the institution, from conducting over 160 years of climate research to using that knowledge to adapt to a changing world. As part of Executive Order 14008, the Smithsonian completed the 2021 Climate Change Action Plan. From a one Smithsonian approach, 
It focuses on public programs, research, collections management, and facilities and infrastructure, and highlights the topic of climate vulnerability. While those topics are interconnected, today I will discuss the risk to our collections and facilities as posed by climate change. These risks and our plans are limited uh, to limit their impact have been laid out in the Climate Change Action Plan, as well as our Climate Change Adaptation Plan, the Roadmap for the Development of Climate Change Adaptation, and the Smithsonian's Collection Space Framework Plan. The recent New York Times article, Saving History with Sandbags, Climate Change Threatens the Smithsonian, has drawn attention to the risks we currently face, risks we are aware of, and the common concerns shared by this committee and the Smithsonian. Based on our 2017 vulnerability assessments, our properties most at risk are the National Museum of American History and the National Museum of Natural History. They are flood prone, flood prone and have extensive lower level spaces housing invaluable collections and building systems. The National Museum of the American Indian and the National Air and Space Museum, while at risk, they are not as vulnerable and have fewer critical lower level spaces and no lower level collections. The National Museum of African American History and Culture had flood mitigation measures included in its original design. We must take steps to protect our collections. Flooding causes more than just water damage. High humidity and temperature fluctuations are possible if our climate control systems or our generators are damaged, and this could impact the objects in our care. Beyond flooding, as the planet warms, it is becoming more challenging and expensive to maintain the environmental controls in these spaces. Even minor fluctuations can harm delicate items. To address these concerns, the Smithsonian's National Collections Program has been purchasing and installing gasketed storage cabinetry to replace substandard storage. These new enclosures can effectively protect the collections from flooding and buffer these environmental fluctuations. The Smithsonian is also developing flood safe spaces to house at risk collections. With construction to begin in fiscal year 22, Pod 6 at the Suitland Collection Center in Maryland will provide space for collections now housed on the National Mall in our basements and at the National Gallery of Art. Once built, the Dulles Collection Center Module 2 will also provide more space for our Air and Space Museum collections. Your bipartisan support of our collection space expansion has made this all possible. Through master planning, flood resilient renovations, and revitalization projects, we have identified uh, that I'm going to mention next. For example, at the Air and Space Museum, the revitalization project includes large underground cisterns to manage stormwater and the addition of higher floodgates at each of our loading docks. At the National Museum of American History in fiscal year 22, we plan for $500,000 um, studies uh, in facilities planning and design. These studies will work on west side drainage improvements and also temporary flood protection. And this will increase our resiliency in those areas. Improving collection storage and making our facilities more climate resilient has been incremental. It must be prioritized and phased over time to optimize Smithsonian's existing funding. The over $1 billion in deferred maintenance further jeopardizes our facilities. Nearly half of this backlog though will be addressed with the revitalization that is planned of our historic core, as well as the National Air Mu and Space Museum revitalization project we're right now in the middle of. The $35 million that Congress has also provided both in fiscal year 2020 and also 2021 for deferred maintenance tasks has been well used. We thank you for the bipartisan letter of support from this committee to our appropriators. We continue to identify strategies between our capital funding and our maintenance funding budget to address our deferred maintenance. While many are focused on the development of our new museums, we need and deeply appreciate your commitment to our existing properties and collections. 
Our future success depends on the stewardship of what we already have. Climate change is one of our greatest challenges, but we remain committed to facing it. The steps we take today will increase the resiliency of our institution, its impressive buildings, and our collections. With your continued support, this is a challenge that we will meet. Thank you again for giving us the opportunity to discuss the current and planned actions we are taking to protect the nation's irreplaceable treasures. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very, very much. And we'll turn now to Inspector General Helm. You are now recognized for about five minutes, but your camera has turned off. There you are. Thank you. Uh, Chairperson Lofgren, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee. Today, I will focus on OIG's oversight of the Smithsonian's longstanding challenges related to the management of its collections and facilities, as well as challenges that the Smithsonian has identified as threats from climate change. As a steward of the national collections, the Smithsonian has the unique responsibility to manage and preserve these collections held in trust. Assembled over 175 years, the National Collections contain more than 155 million items. We have done extensive work concerning collection stewardship and found a pattern of issues, such as inadequate preservation practices, insufficient inventory controls, and security of collections that do not meet Smithsonian standards. In an audit of the National Museum of American History, we found that many collections were stored in substandard conditions, not conducive to long-term preservation. We were particularly troubled by the collection storage conditions at the Garber facility in Suitland, Maryland. Built in the 50s and 60s, these buildings have exceeded their intended useful lives as temporary storage. The collapse of one of the buildings from snow and wind in 2010 and damage to other buildings from the earthquake in 2011 clearly demonstrated the risk to the collections. We also found that improvements were needed to collection storage areas across the Smithsonian. In response to our recommendation, the Smithsonian completed in 2014 its first comprehensive survey of the condition of the spaces used to store Smithsonian's collections and found that 70 47% of this space was unacceptable. The Smithsonian developed a 30 year plan to improve collection space conditions, which is now estimated to cost more than $1.5 million to fully implement. The Smithsonian also faces challenges in the deferred maintenance of its more than 600 facilities. In 2016, we reported that the Smithsonian had not reduced the backlog of deferred maintenance because it is spending less than the recommended amounts to maintain the condition of its facilities. The National Research Council recommends that government funded organizations spend two to 4% of their current replacement value of their facilities on maintenance. The Smithsonian has been spending approximately 1% annually. Given the disparity, the Smithsonian estimates that deferred maintenance backlog will grow by 232% during this decade. The Smithsonian has facilities and collections in areas that may be affected by flooding, storm surge, and rising sea levels. In 2014, the Smithsonian released a statement that identifies ways that the Smithsonian will respond to climate change such as by protecting its core assets, the national collections, and operating its facilities and programs in a sustainable manner. This year, the Smithsonian issued its first annual climate change action plan. The plan identifies ongoing and planned projects to reduce the impact of flooding in vulnerable areas on the National Mall and in New York City. It also notes that the Smithsonian needs to update its vulnerability assessments related to flooding based on the latest national climate assessment. And finally, the plan identifies the challenges that the Smithsonian faces in maintaining ongoing resources for flood protection with competing priorities, 
such as the development of two new museums and the major renovations of four museums and the castle. We have not evaluated this action plan or its implementation. However, we will certainly consider this area for future work. Thank you and I welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, now we will turn to our final witness. Mr. Fanavong, you are now recognized for uh, five minutes. We welcome your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair President Rothgren, Ranking Member Davids, and members of the committee. My name is Padmano Panavong. I am a senior project manager at Atkins North America, former DC National Flood Insurance Program coordinator and floodplain manager. Atkins is a member of SNC Liveline Group, one of the world's leading professional services and project man management organization with more than 30,000 employees worldwide. Our primary focus is on the build and nat natural environment and as we provide services in sectors such as, such as power, renewable, and, and water. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to talk about a climate resilience that I'm passionate about and also to discuss how the Smithsonian might enhance its facilities against the effects of climate change. I will divide my, uh, divide my testimony into three distinct sections. First, Federal Triangle Flooding in 2006. Second, Interagency Flood Risk Management Team in DC. And lastly, collaborative governance and comprehensive solutions that are needed. Washington DC, particularly the Federal Triangle area is vulnerable to three types of flooding. First, riverine flooding, uh, where flood water overflow the Potomac and Anacostia rivers. Second, coastal flooding, where hurricane storm surge pushes flood water from the Atlantic Ocean to the city. And lastly, interior flooding that is caused by heavy, heavy rainfall that cannot be absorbed by the ground and overwhelm the drainage system. Floods of each type have occurred in the recent past in DC, including interior flooding in Federal Triangle in 2006 and recently in 2019. These floods can have a significant impact on buildings and infrastructure. The 2006 Federal Triangle flood destroyed critical parts of the Internal Revenue Services of IRS headquarters electrical and mechanical equipment and submerged the basement level under five feet of water. The 2006 flood exposed the collections of Smithsonian uh, Museum, National Gallery of Art, and National Archive of these facilities are vulnerable to water damage. Future flood risk in Federal Triangle is expected to increase uh, because of climate change, including changes in precipitation and sea level rise. According to Climate Ready DC, developed by the DC Department of Energy and Environment, the climate projections indicated annual rainfall and the frequency and severity of storm will change over time. Uh, sea level rise is expected to make DC flooding more frequent and severe. In the past decade, DC has implemented multiple initiatives and maintained interagency collaboration and coordination to enhance uh, climate resilience. Established in 2014, the DC Silver Jacket is an interagency team that coordinates and collaborates among many federal, regional, and DC agencies, and is co-led by the DC Department of Energy and Environment, the US Army Corps of Engineers, and the National Park Service. The Smithsonian is also an active member of the DC Silver Jacket. Following the 2006 flood, there was significant interest in mitigating flood risk in, in the area. Several studies were conducted, uh, various actions were, were taken. Some entity with facility and infrastructure in the area implemented flood proofing measures specific to their own facilities. The 2011 Federal Triangle Storm Water Drainage Study identified system-wide solutions, such as constructing storage tank uh, under the National Mall, pumping stations, and, some, and um, new tunnels that would reduce the impact of flooding. In 2018, the DC Silver Jackets re-engaged the stakeholders, review new strategy, and identify barriers that, to implement the system-wide solutions that, that I mentioned, including lack of ownership and authority, and funding and financing of projects. 
managing DC flood risk, particularly in federal tri triangle, requires integrated approaches in terms of one, governance in developing policies, and two, a comprehensive solution that serves multiple purposes. Despite multiple efforts so far, there is a need a sing for a single agency or a body that have authority needed to coordinate, manage, and implement flood risk project in federal triangle. Managing flood risk falls not only under flood plan or emergency management, but also stormwater, land use planning, and many other programs within federal and DC agencies. In addition to individual measures, system-wide solutions are required to manage this complexity of flooding in that area. Thank you again for affording me the opportunity to speak with you today. And I, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Well, thank you. And thanks to all three of our witnesses for their very um, excellent testimony. Now is the time when members of the committee uh, can pose questions to the witnesses. And I'll, I'll turn first to our ranking member, Mr. Davis, for questions that he may have. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to uh, start with Mr. Potavon. Uh, Mr. Potavon, um, thanks again for being here today. And the November 25th article by the New York Times, Saving History with Sandbags, Climate Change Threatens the Smithsonian. You know, the author includes the image of a 100-year floodplain, which engulfs most of the northern half of the National Mall all the way to the Capitol. And frankly, it looks like the balcony outside of uh, my office and, and uh, my colleague on the committee, Mr. Butterfield's office, uh, if this is correct and this happens, we, we might have some waterfront property off of that. Uh, I'd like unanimous consent, Madam Chair, to actually insert this article into the record. Without, yeah. without objection, that will be um, made part of the record. Thank you. Mr. Potomac, how likely do you think it is that we will experience flooding as depicted in the zone shown in that image? The the flood zone that you mentioned that um, that consider a um, 100 year flood plain or 1% chance is it's, it's a regulatory flood level that the National Flood Insurance Program um, determined in in um, many decades ago. So it's, okay. it's a chance. So that that would likely happen. All right. In, in your opinion, does this image portray what is expected as a worst case scenario? Or can we expect there to be more extreme flooding threats to the National Mall? No, this is not the worst case. Again, this is this area that depicted what you see is 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 a regulatory flood level that that we as a nation determine or, or Congress or you know the program determined that's a regulatory in terms of flood insurance and also flood plan management regulation in terms of development as also, the way that the flood map has been developed in the past, we're looking at the historical data to be to map it out. We haven't began to begun to look at the future condition that I mentioned, right? Um, according to many uh, science-based reports, including the DOEE, uh, we have the climate projected rainfall to looking to look at the future, what the future will look like. And that needs to be part of the conversation now that whether or not historical data is enough to, to be able to design our system, to be able to plan our area. To answer your question more, the, it will get worse. I, I, okay, thank you. So if, it's get, if you think it could be worse, I mean, then we should be considered about the other portions of the National Mall and what sort of threat does this pose for the collections placed on the National Mall already? Should the Smithsonian change how it's storing its historical artifacts and art? And should they change plans for new museums being built on the mall? I, I would I would add to that, um, as I mentioned, the complexity of the area. Think about the area is at the bottom of a bowl. You have water coming from all sides. You're coming from upstream Potomac watershed coming down through the Potomac and Anacostia River. You have water, tidal water from Atlantic coming up, and you have the rainfall, 
that coming down from the sky that we cannot manage with the own system. And another type of flooding, and I think we have some uh, um, papers and Lofton mentioned is the Tiber Creek. We have, we build the area, particularly in DC, on top of the creek. So, and water, they like to go to the low spot. So we have water coming all, all side. There should be a system to be able to in, figure out how to in, how to manage and be able to predict this type of flooding. You know, uh, uh, sir, I, I've got some more questions I need to, to ask some more people. So I'm going to reclaim my time from you. I appreciate your responses. Uh, Ms. Thank Bechtel, you. The Smithsonian's Climate Change Action Plan agrees with the New York Times that the National Mall is at risk of becoming a floodplain in the coming years. Uh, how is the Smithsonian using this information on deciding locations for future museums? Uh, thank you for this question. Um, we are taking uh, all environmental aspects to a possible site location for our new museum. So we're currently looking at a site evaluation study where we're looking at 24 different sites as possible locations for these two new museums. Two of those uh, sites uh, have um, uh, could potentially have flood uh, risk involved in their selection. So it's part of our criteria that we're taking very seriously in analyzing all 24 of those locations. Great, I see I'm out of time, but I, I certainly believe, Madam Chair of this committee, if, if these flood levels are going to happen uh, in the next six to eight years or whatever time period the so-called experts uh, want us to, to address, then well, this committee needs to start talking about the mosquito abatement issues that we're going to have in and around the Rayburn building, um, what type of threats we're going to have to deal with as a campus. So, I mean, at some point we have to stop the hypocrisy of building new museums and planning to build new museums on the National Mall at the same time, talking about flood levels that we have yet to see and that we clearly are, are discussing today and what the majority wants to plan for. So. With that, thank you all very much, and I yield back. Gentleman uh, yields back. Um, I now would turn to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin. Uh, Chair Lofgren, thank you so much for calling this important hearing. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, Mr. Fanavong, um, let, let me start with this. Don't we already have some levees that we've built? Uh, and how well are those levees working? Do they need to be updated? or refurbished for the future. I think about what happened in New Orleans. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Again, uh, I want to mention about the different types of flooding, right? And and the levy that that we that the, the Corps of Engineers that Bell and the National Park Service maintain that you, you you mentioned is to protect the water that overflow from the Potomac River that address two types of that flooding, the, the river rain and coastal. And we still have that area, we still have issue with the interior flooding from the rainfall behind it that levee doesn't protect. So that's another type of flooding, you, you know, that, it, that, that needs to have a comprehensive looking at the area rather than just one system that may not protect them all. I got you. In your testimony, you um, underscored the importance of creating a central body or authority that could make flood management decisions, um, both preventive and then also corrective. Um, and um, do you have a specific proposal that's on the table? Um, based on my uh, experience when I was with DC government, working with multiple agency, including um, many uh, agency under the DC Silver Jacket, we, um, in my opinion, we need an agency, a federal government agency, that be able to communicate with other federal agencies and also have subject subject matter expert on on the issue, the technical subject expert and understand a lot of information that can be shared among agency that can be a uh, very sensitive issue that you know we have dc government agency we have a uh, regional agency like dc water and and Vermont, the, the washington metro uh, agency 
So perhaps, in my opinion, as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has already been involved with coordination under the CDC silver jackets in, in the issue and, and be able to get everyone at the table and have the subject matter expert on the flood issue, perhaps they, they would be the, the appropriate agency to, to take a close look at the issue. Okay. It's just my opinion and my experience working with many agencies. Um, have you worked with the National Mall Underground Coalition, which is a group that I've consulted with in the past on this issue? I I have been in the past. I, I have I have talked to them and have seen their proposal. Well, and, uh, what's happened with their proposal, their multi-use proposal for preparing for flooding and then also dealing with other issues? Um. That type of solution, I think that that needs to be looked at, right? That the, the, the comprehensive and system wide solution, looking at different issue and provide co benefit. So I think it it deserves to to be looked at the feasibility of it, of whether or not it can be speaking in in the engineering kind of technical term. It it. It's a project that try to solve the problem that we have, not just the technical engineering solution, but also the provide benefit. When we think about climate change, right? We, we talk about both mitigation and adaptation, mitigation in terms of cut greenhouse gas emission. So I think any solution that we post in this area, we need to be able to provide those benefits as well, not just address flooding, but maybe address air pollution, address other needs of the area because we have so much um, limited resources. I, I think that solution that try to capture that and and it, in my opinion, it, it deserved to be looked at. Thank you. I, I yield back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Mr. Stile is recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Appreciate you holding today's hearing. I would love an opportunity to have a broad hearing, but let's dive in. Uh, on the topic as presented uh, today. Mr. Uh, Panavong, um, in particular, you know, we saw a lot of rain in March. There was a recent New York Times article. I don't know if that was some of the impetus for the majority uh, bringing this specific of a hearing that came out recently, kind of looking at the March rain, its impact on the Smithsonian. Uh, was the amount of rain that we experienced in March out of line for kind of broad storms in the DC area, maybe for March, but maybe not for July? Um, we start seeing more and more now, uh, not just uh, un under understood the frequency. So, but, but was the amount of rain that came down <laughs> like very abnormal to you in, in terms of what these facilities should be able to handle? Yes. It was how far, how far yes. outside the norm would, would you consider that March storm? Um, I, I don't have the number to be able to look at. To, to answer you right now, but but it's something that it wasn't the design. I t t tell you what, I'd, I'd, love, I'd, I'd love a little bit of a, a flavor. Maybe you can provide some comments into the record uh, when we're done as to how significantly different this storm was uh, than previous storms that would occur in a, any given year. I think that'd be helpful for us to understand the, the risk level, because what we're looking at, as you correctly said earlier, you know, we're sitting, uh, many of the Smithsonian buildings are sitting in a hundred year flood zone, which really means that it's got a 1% chance in any given year uh, to experience uh, significant flooding. So meaning over a 30 year uh, period, almost a one in three chance that you're going to see a flood uh, during that hundred during that 30 year period. And so I think it's interesting that we got the Smithsonian at one hand, uh, investing significantly in buildings in the mall, uh, many of these areas, a hundred year flood zone. Uh, and at the same time, trying to talk about how do we mitigate the current infrastructure. I think it's a challenge uh, that we need to hit head on. And so if I can, I'd like to jump over to you, Ms. Bechtel. Uh, and in particular, it was noted uh, that the backlog uh, has been building dramatically. And we, you've been setting, I believe the Smithsonian has been setting aside roughly 1% of the annual budget uh, to address uh, maintenance facilities. Is that correct? That is correct. 
what would be, I, I'm more familiar in residential, kind of the general rule of thumb of somebody who buys a house is that it's going to be about a 2% of the value of the house. So you got to set aside uh, for maintenance. I'm not uniquely familiar on museum properties. What would be kind of the industry average or the industry recommended uh, percent that one would set aside uh, in a given year? So cultural facilities such as ourselves, it would be between two and 4%. So and, and so is is the request though one percent or is there is that the been the funded amount and the request has been between two and four the the request we are currently at the one percent and we were fortunate enough to receive that 35 million dollar plus up in fiscal year 20 and 21. it would it would beg the question though it, it, it maybe you can just enlighten me is why would the request be one percent when the the general average would be two to four percent and we're seeing a significant backlog it seems like the request may be uh, quite low. Well, this surge in funding, both in fiscal year 20 and 21, there's a lot of work that goes into pre preparing essentially to execute that funding. And we were able to execute that funding in both fiscal years by over 90%, uh, even though we had two year funding at that time. So, so we're really pleased with this incremental approach and um, it, it just allows us to really identify and work our scopes of work and really correctly um, plan for how to execute that money so that we execute it correctly as, as hard so, for, as it is. So is it fair to say then that the, the reason the request is less than, ha uh, less than half of kind of what you consider the industry average is because there's not a, not a, a, a capacity to be able to maintain the maintenance levels that one would normally like to see? Yeah. Our, well, our plan is to actually get up to that 2% mark. So okay. we hope for this incremental increase each year. And, and how do you compare that to what, what I would consider the pretty significant overhauls that we're seeing either at the Hirshhorn, uh, which is undergoing significant um, overhauls right now, or air and space uh, versus kind of the incremental year to year maintenance? Are you How are you balancing those two issues? And, and you're absolutely right. It's a balancing act and both are absolutely imperative. So we talked about the deferred maintenance uh, increase and that uh, gradual increase much needed. But in addition to that, it's also the capital dollar. So both for our air and space uh, revitalization project that we're at about 50% complete right now, in addition to when we begin our castle and our arts and industries renovations that we're calling that historic core revitalization project both of those projects when we complete them will take 50 percent of that deferred maintenance away so okay I, I, they are I large it. capital they, projects i appreciate it only cognizant of the time otherwise I, I would like to have this conversation much longer but madam chairwoman uh, i will yield back when he yields back i'd ask unanimous consent uh, to put in the record the letter that I wrote, and I was so pleased that the ranking member assigned uh, on with me to the Appropriations uh, Committee asking for robust funding, uh, really a, a huge increase in the maintenance budget for the Smithsonian. Our committee has been very firm on that. At this point, I would like to recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me say good afternoon to all of you and just thank you so much for your friendship. Thank you for the incredible work that all of you do on, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, you know, we are running up now to the Christmas holidays and let me just wish all of you a very, very Merry Christmas and, and a prosperous and productive new year. And, and to our witnesses today, thank you as well for, for your testimony. Uh, let me let me begin, if I can, Madam Chair, by by speaking to uh, the facilities director, Miss Miss Bechtol. Uh, Miss Bechtol, we we've talked a lot uh, over the last few minutes about uh, flooding and the effects that that climate change uh, can have on our our assets, and certainly this is an important uh, conversation to have. Uh, but but are there other concerns that we may have other than flooding? Uh, that, that may be connected to climate change, but are there any other matters that we need to talk about other than the flooding potential? Absolutely. I would say two that are for, in the forefront of our planning, and that is around the, the increased intensity of the storms that we're seeing. And of course, whether that is through wind, through those terrible storms we just had, or whether that's through rain, that is something that we have all of our risk mitigations in place to protect ourselves from. Um, so that is something we're also uh, very concerned about and, and planning um, all kinds of training, all kinds of 
of um, in in house uh, mitigations from the standpoint of just if it happens, we will be ready for it. Thank you. I, I think you may have mentioned that the uh, African American, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, uh, since it has been recently built, that, that it that it was built with uh, certain protections in mind. That it was that that it was right. built to 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 protect against this type of uh, catastrophe. Uh, is it one hundred percent safe, or do we need to do any fortification of of the African American Museum? Uh, we feel very comfortable with our African American Museum and the mitigations that we built into the design. So just as two examples, we have flood walls that are actually built into the design. They serve also security functions. They also hold water back um, and they're beautiful. Um, so they serve all three purposes. We also built in redundancy in our equipment. So in several of our such as things as our water pumps and several of our pieces of major maintenance equipment, we actually built in redundancy so that if something happens to one piece of equipment, I will be able to run another pump and to be able to keep pumping that water out if that water table was to come up, whether it's through flooding or some other emergency. Thank you. Now, we have museums all across the country, and, and of course, uh, our museum here in Washington is the premier of, of all of the museums. Uh, but is the Smithsonian collaborating with other museums in, in other states and jurisdictions about uh, climate change's impact on, on their facilities? Absolutely. I would say we communicate and collaborate within all of the cultural museums and, and zoos that are throughout our country as well as the world. In addition to that, it is very important to continue our collaborations with the district government, with all of the surrounding federal agencies. Uh, it was already talked about the Silver Jackets uh, organization. That is an organization that brings us all together. We have to understand that this is a regional problem. This is not just the Smithsonian problem, though we're a piece of it and an important piece of it, but really the entire, this affects the entire government. So we have to come together uh, to work on these uh, solutions. That, that's, uh, that's kind of what I suspected, and I, th I thank yeah. you for that. Let me conclude with the Inspector General. Uh, is there a relationship, sir, between the Smithsonian's, I mean, ma'am, uh, Ms. Helm, is there a relationship between the Smithsonian's collections management challenges, the challenges that we face, and the backlog of deferred maintenance. Is there a connection there? I would say there is a connection. Many of the yeah. projects that are going to be used to address flooding are actually maintenance projects. And, um, you know, I think our work has also pointed out that our collections are at risk because um, they're in inadequate storage space um, that are vulnerable to uh, flooding and weather. Um, so there is a connection. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to yield back and wish all a very Merry Christmas. I think it's proper to say Happy Holidays. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Butterfield. Uh, Mr. Aguilar is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for being here. Um, Ms. Bechtel, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about that New York Times article um, that the ranking member mentioned. Uh, it stated that several entities, including the National Park Service, the Army Corps, and the District of Columbia Water Utility, and the National Capital Planning Commission, share the responsibility for controlling flooding on the National Mall. Are there ongoing conversations or discussions that would create a single employee designation for someone uh, on our side to specifically manage these risks, including how to mitigate those ongoing issues to protect our nation's history? I don't know about a single person, uh, but I would probably think that it, the, the problem is so vast that the Army Corps of Engineers would probably be the agency that is the most experienced and, and has the most uh, expertise in this area. I think it's also important to understand that every uh, unit, so a Smithsonian institution has to have medications in place to protect its pr property. And it's also important to understand that we need redundancy. So even with that uh, you know, global government response, which I highly recommend, we would also need to take care of our own facilities too. I appreciate it. I, I feel a little uh, put on notice by the by the chair is the is an appropriator on the on the committee uh, relating to her uh, letter with the ranking member. 
Um, so I did want to talk a little bit about costs. Uh, to Ms. Bechtel and Ms. Helm, uh, the New York Times article mentioned that the Smithsonian is, is looking for a half a million dollars to begin working on the separate $39 million plan for flood walls and other structural changes uh, to fortify the American History Museum. Can you talk about uh, the timeline that the repairs could take if if funding was secured and and if we fail to address uh, these issues what would be the total cost to to retroactive, retroactively uh, protect these artifacts i guess kathy i'll i'll maybe start uh with the answer and then kathy can follow follow on um at our american history museum so we master plan first and then after this master planning, it really puts into a, a period of, of flow from, from essentially the beginning of the planning to actually execution. Inside our 10 year capital plan, we actually have a plan to take care of that museum with, with flood mitigation measures when we do the revitalization of the entire east side of that museum. We are in the process of building a new collection storage facility so that we can swing that collection uh, on the east side of the museum, as well as all of the collections that are still in the basement out to our pod six facility in Suitland, Maryland. Once those collections are removed, that entire revitalization will begin. That's all within our next 10 year capital plan. Ms. Hill? Um, what I would like to add is that um, our work um, actually led to the recommendation that Smithsonian uh, develop a comprehensive plan looking Smithsonian wide to identify the collection space uh, needs. And given the decentralized nature of the Smithsonian, the most prudent cost effective way to approach that is through a comprehensive plan that looks for what are the highest risk and allocates the um, available funds in the most cost effective way and and that's been our contribution thank you miss helm um miss helm talking about that prioritization and and your role um are, are we aware of any types of you know salvage plans or or what type of prioritization if an event were to occur um would the smithsonian undertake uh, and again i guess this is for for both of you but but wanted to start with miss helm um or, any prioritization of a, of a salvage plan in case we needed to protect artifacts um, and if, if an event was occurring? So I think that uh, would probably fall under the implementation of the uh, collection space framework. And um, as I uh, mentioned, our work uh, led to the development of that plan, and we have not yet uh, gone back to look at its implementation. Ms. Bechtel? I, I Okay, I would just in interject that we have established starting in 2016 a training program that for preparedness and response in collections emergencies. And we have stood up an SI wide team of professionals that actually would come in uh, to have uh, any type of emergency would come in to respond. Uh, that team is made up of our security workforce, our maintenance workforce, our operations cleaning workforce, as well as those collections managers. And so with this team approach, we feel comfortable uh, in being able to respond to really any sort of emergency. We practice this, this response uh, in training sessions. And then we've also had, unfortunately, several uh, different um, emergencies, as we've mentioned in the testimony earlier, um, that we've, we've gotten practice through response, whether it's been through snow issues or uh, flooding issues issues. Thank you, Ms. Bechtel. I'll yield back, Madam Chair. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you so much. And thank you to our witnesses. You know, this is very deja vu for us here in the Delaware Valley, because at the end of this summer, when Hurricane Ida tore yes. through here, um, we had tornadoes. We had not once in a hundred year floods, but once in a thousand year floods. And one of the big victims of that flooding, I see Ms. Bechtel nodding her head. I think she knows where I'm going. Um, the Brandywine River Art Museum, which houses the Andrew Wyeth collection, was inundated. Every one of the 10 buildings on that property were flooded. They had about $6 million worth of damage. I mean, the, the heart-stopping part of it is that um, none of the Wyeths were damaged. Um, they were all above the second floor level, but this flood went up to the second floor level 
all of the HVAC systems and everything got ruined. Um, so, uh, Mr. Fanavong, I, I, I guess the first question is, we were talking a little bit earlier about these 100-year flood plans, but what we're reading in the wake of the, the, um, the flooding that we had here is that those predictors aren't so useful anymore because they're based on historic data and we're seeing a historical, a typical uh, water flooding, et cetera. Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure, thank you for your question. Um, you're right. Um, a lot of, particular in DC, we have a lot of data looking at the future, what the future will look like in terms of precipitation and sea level rise. As, as part of the planning, we, we need to start to, in incorporate these new numbers, new projection in our planning. Yes, we have the 100 year flood map, you know, as a regulatory flood map as something that, you know, many facility manager had been using, the city had been using for planning. Mm -hmm. In fact, the DC new comprehensive plan and also the, the federal element by National Capital Planning Commission recognize the future condition due to the climate change and projection. We need to start to, to take that science down to the engineering level and, and planning level, what would, would look like in different scenarios so that we can plan for, you know, either we want to be there or we want to be, you know, strengthen our building, existing building to against and that, that new, new, you know, reality. I think that's where we are right now. That are we ready to, I mean, the technology and science is there. I think we just need the policies and the way that we design and construction thing to 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 meet that new the new challenge. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more that we need to use the data and the science we have to project the future. And I find it interesting that in the business world, the capitalist side of it, insurance companies are using that data. Insurance companies are using that science to project risk. Um, so I think we 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 in the government need to get on, on track as well. Ms. Bechtel, can you um, speak a little bit to any lessons learned from the Brandywine River Museum uh, situation? Yeah, I, I, I was horrified to, to hear about that day. And of course, we didn't have a lot of notice in that storm. So that was one where the weather didn't really project that level of, of, of water. You know, the New York Times article mentioned sandbagging and honest to goodness, if you have time, that that is really a mitigation mitigation measure that could have been used uh, around that museum, but it's so close to the to the water. I, I guess in my lessons learned, it has been to really prepare the Smithsonian for every possible right outcome and and to really have an in-house work staff so we work 24 7 at the smithsonian institution and sometimes these storms happen in the middle of the night and and when the 2006 flood occurred on the washington uh and the, along constitution avenue on our nation's capital that flooding uh also affected our smithsonian institution but we actually had staff that was able to respond in instantaneously when that water started to come up. So that is something that I understand is it costs money to staff things, but with irreplaceable artifacts, the in-house staff is absolutely critical. And then it has to be trained and they have to have the materials right available in order to respond right away. Yeah, and unfortunately with a 21 foot flood, <laughs> Right. Um, sandbags weren't going to do it, but no. but the fact that they had pre-planned to keep the art on the higher floors at least was That's was right. helpful. So we That's do right. do appreciate your efforts and and see the need yeah. to proceed. And the Brandywine River Museum has reopened for the holidays, which is a really important part of yes. this year. So yes. I would urge folks to visit if they're able. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Lady yields back. The uh, representative from New Mexico is recognized. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Lofgren, uh, and, and thank you to our witnesses. Um, you know, as we've heard earlier, as the New York Times article said it, as we all believe it in our core, that, you know, our history, our art, our culture, it's, it, it's, an, it's an integral part, both in the bad part of that history and culture and the good part of that history culture, and it needs to be protected. And, you know, then we have the concept of, being real honest, being very honest uh, about what climate change is doing 
to all parts of our lives. Uh, and that in so many different ways that we might not have thought of, uh, we need to both address the underlying cause of uh, of the climate change and then do whatever we can to protect us. I really did uh, appreciate Mr. Fonavong's assessment that technology and science is there. You know, we just need to put it into action. We need to fund it. We need to get those plan in place and then actually make it happen. Um, and we've heard today uh, a lot about how the Smithsonian plans to protect its existing work, but I'd like to pivot to future collections um, in, and, and actually the latest museums, as you were talking about the museums that are most at risk, the newest museums are in a better position. Um, but I wanna talk about the National Museum of the American Latino and the American Women's History Museum. Um, there are many, myself included, who want these museums to be located on the mall, right? Because that, that is where all the key stories are told. And if we are gonna have sort of E equality and geographic setting to tell those stories, having it on the mall is key. So we can plan, we can use science to how do we now build those museums in a way that protects them uh, as we look at these futures so that they are part of, they are part of the planning and part of the building of how we protect them and all of the museums. So Director Bechtal, can you discuss how you're incorporating resiliency into your plans as you look at those facilities? Um, and uh, um, I, I understood that when you were uh, thinking about the National Museum of African American History, you also included that. Can you tell us you know, how you're using those lessons as you plan for the Latino History Museum and the Women's History Museum? Absolutely. I think our African American History and Culture Museum has, has essentially showcased that if, if we know what that science is and where that location is and we can study it, then we can build in design measures to protect the to protect that facility. And in relationship to both of the new museums, we are also planning on not housing the collections in these facilities. So the collections will be housed in state-of-the-art facilities that are built to house collections, and they will be off the National Mall. So both in Dulles, Virginia, as well as in um, our Suitland, Maryland campuses. Both of those campuses do not have flood issues. And there's other risks, as you can imagine, uh, but there, there's flood risk is not one of them. Um, so that's really what we're doing with the new museums. And, and uh, we're not really worried about being able to place those museums if the sites are selected that are on the nation's mall, we, we will design in flood resiliency into those two new museums. Thank you very much. I think that's just so very wise. You're taking that off the table. There are other considerations, but let's focus on, on the why with leaving that out. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, but it seems to me that as I've been listening to this hearing, as I read the testimony, it's Congress that needs to give you some money to be able to get this done. What are some of the other major barriers to implementing the plan? If I told you, what do you need from Congress? What's your answer gonna be? I, if I was to answer first up, it is your continued support. Uh, I would say that the Smithsonian Institution is extremely fortunate to have the federal support that it does. We're also very fortunate to be able to fundraise and also have private and corporate support. So we sort of get the best of all worlds. And I think it beho behooves us to plan accordingly, have solid planning, and be able to give notice uh, both to Congress as well as OMB what our requirements requirements actually are. Thank you, Vala. And in the 20 seconds I have left, what would you add to that, Mr. Von Oh, oh me, sorry. Uh, my time is up. I was, I was asking what you thought Congress uh, should do to do the protections, but my time is up and I will uh, yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll uh, now ask just a couple of questions. Uh, First, um, let me say, I think this has been a very helpful uh, hearing and it was important to focus on this threat because, you know, you have a broad discussion. This can be lost in the shuffle, but this is a very important element of our future. Uh, let me just ask you, Ms. Bechtel, have any items in the Smithsonian collection already been damaged or destroyed because of flooding? or other climate related issues? 
not a single item has has been uh, affected by flooding. Uh, so we have been very fortunate uh, with all of our responsiveness uh, to be able to protect even when we've had flooding threats. Well, I want to thank you for that good news and also thank the staff of the Smithsonian for the extraordinary work that they have done uh, to protect America's heritage uh, and the artifacts that are so important uh, to us. Let me just ask, uh, last week we had historic tornadoes that devastated parts of the central United States, and including, and our uh, prayers are with uh, our ranking members' constituents, there was a tornado that uh, killed people in his district. Uh, we know from our review and the science committee, which I also serve on, has looked at these issues, weather events are becoming more extreme because of uh, climate change. Now, the, the D.C. area isn't historically affected by tornadoes like other parts of the country. However, they can and do strike here. Um, a few years ago, a tornado damaged the National Mall, and this summer there were several tornadoes in this area, including one just a mile from the Capitol. To what extent has the Smithsonian planning for climate change and extreme weather also address this potential threat? I'll start with that, and Kathy may have others, others to add. We look at all risk, and certainly climate change has multiple factors, even from the standpoint of fire is a potential for some of our facilities that are in the Arizona, uh, Arizona area. Um, we are looking at uh, certainly wind risk or something like that when it comes to we're open to the public every day, so it isn't just safeguarding our collections, but it's also, of course, safeguarding our staff and safeguarding our uh, in our public. So we also drill uh, and have whole safe um, protocol, safety protocols that we communicate out, not just to our Smithsonian staff, but also to our public in the event that a storm such as a tornado would be imminent. And we practice this communication uh, throughout our facilities on a routine basis. And it is really to, like I mentioned, not just to protect our collection, we're also trying to protect that wonderful public that comes to see us every single day. Um, so I, I would say it is in it is in training, but it's also just being aware of what's potentially possible and then drilling that throughout our staff to prepare. Ms. Helm, do you have anything to, to add to that? Oh, I would like to add one thing and um, our work has demonstrated that the Smithsonian collections and facilities are already at risk. It's not really a future. There are future risks that could be magnified with climate uh, change, but they're currently at risk. Um, there are collections in the basement at the American History and Natural History Museum, which are two of the most vulnerable uh, museums on the mall to flooding. And then, as I mentioned, out at the Garber facility, um, there, there was a building that collapsed uh, about 10 years ago uh, during a weather storm. Um, so um, I just want to uh, emphasize that the risk is now as well. Right. Um, let me ask, we focused on the federal triangle and as is appropriate, but we have also uh, another uh, Smithsonian um, institution in Washington, D.C., and that's the zoo. Um, now, it's not near the floodplain, but it is right near Rock Creek. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, maybe this, this question is to you, um, Mr. Panangong, but is that a flood risk as well up there, the National Zoo? Should, are we prepared up there as well? Uh, the location of the National Zoo, it, it, it next to Rock Creek was also has you know floodplain area but it's not as 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 a threat like in the federal triangle i think that there's some some area further down closer to the creek that that needs to be uh, pay attention to maybe potential erosions and some other types of measure that to to protect that but but in terms of flood risk it's not as as high i would say in, in comparison to with the, the federal triangle area. 
Well, I, I, um, first, I, I want to thank all of the witnesses for the testimony here uh, today. You know, it's very clear that we have a, a real time now need to take steps uh, to protect the Smithsonian. I think uh, that we have a blueprint for doing that. Um, I'm encouraged that the planning, you know, we had bipartisan support for the two new museums that are being uh, uh, pursued and that the location uh, will be very deeply informed by the climate change challenge that we face. We don't want to create new problems. But what has been made clear to me is that this is an issue beyond, clear, clearly beyond the Smithsonian threat, but you know, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Education is right along in this floodplain as well. The Botanical Gardens is not built to withstand uh, this flooding. So I do think that we uh, need to contact I think it would be the oversight committee, but there needs to be a broader examination of this that includes the GSA, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, as well as the architect of the Capitol, uh, so that we can uh, make a plan for climate resiliency uh, sooner rather than later. Because we know, as was mentioned uh, by one of my colleagues, the it's very clear that the historical records that we have relied on are not reliable anymore. The, the pace of change because of climate change has made those predictions unreliable. So we need to uh, pick up the pace on this. Uh, our committee has just a small piece of the jurisdiction, but I will be in touch with the oversight committee because uh, there are many other uh, aspects to this. I, I, I also note uh, that uh, the committee is, I think Mr. Style had additional questions and others of us may have additional questions. If so, we will send them to you in writing, each of our witnesses, and we'd ask that if you could respond promptly, we would appreciate that and we will keep the hearing record open uh, so that that exchange of questions and answers can be completed. Now, if there's no further business uh, before the committee, I would like to thank once again all the members and the witnesses